first professor Udo Chakravarti, Department of Political Science, Delhi University to come to the stage and say something about what is basically the minority. Whenever we start with a definition, we end with difficulty, we end with confusion. Because I think, you know, I personally feel that a definition should come out of the discussion that we undertake to tackle with or to grapple with a particular phenomenon. But, you know, today it's just the reverse. So let me, you know, uh, as Venkat Ramaniji already mentioned, let me flag out some of the ideas which I have. Now, when talking about minority, you know, I, was, I did a little bit of research. And I found out that whenever I wanted to find, understand the concept of minority in the Indian tradition, I was very disappointed. I started with Vivekananda. And there I found that Vivekananda was highlighting constantly the idea of universe being a family. Vasudhaiva Kutumbatam. That's typical Vivekananda's conceptualism. So Vivekananda didn't have any specific interest, specific focus on the minority. He was trying to conceptualize humanity as one. Then from Vivekananda, you know, I, I looked at Banki. And there also Banki was trying to conceptualize a particular historical context with reference to his understanding. And he had very, just a very well-defined opinion about a particular group of people who ruled India earlier. If you look at Anandmar, it's based on his own understanding of Muslim atrocities which are committed during the medieval period. But you know, somehow the other, I didn't find any you know, caustic remarks about the Muslims. And I tried to understand how did he conceptualize Muslims in the context of India being conceptualized as a unit. You know, unfortunately, I didn't find any specific reference. So definitionally, you know, the, I, I was searching for definition. Definitionally, it was very disappointing. Then I came to modern times. I looked at Gandhiji his writings, his texts. And you know, I found a very interesting reference in Hind Swaraj. <coughs> the text which was written <coughs> which was written <coughs> in Text 
Entry to the practice is not easy. <laughs> that is the activism. That is the activism. <laughs> so, you know, this text was written in 1909. <coughs> and there, Gandhiji was asked about his attitude towards cow or beef, beef meat or cow meat. And Gandhiji, you know, did not say anything categorical. But he mentioned that I would request my Mohammedan friends not to eat beef because that would affect my, that would affect the interest of my Hindu brothers. So you know, I, I was even in this same context, Mahatma Gandhi's attitude towards the minority, the Mohammedans, is an attempt to accommodate them with the mainstream by being sensitive to their specific requirements. This is, you know, Mahatma Gandhi. And then, you know, I just looked at, you know, B.R. Ambedkar. How did he conceptualize? Now, B.R. Ambedkar, as you know, when this right to religion, right to freedom of religion, when it was being debated, he, very interestingly, remained quiet. If you look at the constitution of the debates, the five volumes, that's about roughly 10,000 pages. You'll find that Ambedkar Sahab talked about on every issue, but remained very quiet with regard to two important issues. One, the right to freedom of religion and Article 370. Now, why did I focus on this? Simply because I was trying to understand his attitude towards minority. In regard to right to freedom of religion, he did not participate in the debate. But in regard to Article 370, he did not even attend the Constitutional Assembly meetings on three, four, three days. He was asked, that time he was law minister of the interim government, he was asked to talk about it. And at that time, Nehru was not in India, he was abroad. Rajendra Prasad, the chairman of the Constitutional Assembly, he was also absent. So Patel was asked, to preside over the meeting. And you know who introduced this article, which is 306A, which became Article 370 later on? By T.T. Krishnamacharya. Mm -hmm. Now then, Ambedkar was asked that why didn't you, you know, talk about it? Then Ambedkar said, you know, as a law minister, I cannot betray my nation. Because Article 370 is a betrayal of the nation. And to avoid that kind of confusion, I abs abstain myself. And then Patel was asked that you, know, you don't agree with this kind of thing because you are talking about unity of the country. Why are you introducing Article 370, 306A? Patel said, you know, I did it because if I did not support this article, he used the word Gaddari. So you know, the point I'm trying to make that everybody is trying to avoid being drawn into definitional issues. So where do I go? Now again, again, I, which I hate doing it, I have to draw on the ideas of the Western thinkers, West, Western ideas. Because somehow or the other, they try to understand the idea of minority, they try to understand the idea of religion, and then they try to, we can think of certain workable definition of religious minority with reference to the debates in the Constitutional Assembly. So these are three you know, things which I'd like to talk about. First of all, I mean, I'm sure, you know, as I mentioned a few minutes ago when I joined, that I'm the odd man out. Um, not that, you know, I'm uh, comfortable with you, but because of my knowledge base, I think I don't know whether I'll be able to deal with this kind of question for which you require a lot of legal you know, expertise, which I don't have. But anyway, I'm putting this before you so that you know, it gets <coughs> debated, it gets discussed, and on the basis of that, probably I can relearn some of that. Now, no legal definition is available to us. I mean, I'm making this statement with responsibility, of Mr. Vikramani, in bring me out. But when we talk of minority, we generally identify three, four 
important factors which constitute a minority. The first one to me, the ethnic characteristic. Ethnic distinctiveness. The second one is cultural distinctiveness. The third is religious identity. Fourth is linguistic. So when we talk about minority, we tend to <coughs> focus on ethnicity, we tend to focus on cultural identity, we tend to focus on religious importance, religious identity, and finally, linguistic distinctiveness. So, broadly speaking, there are the four important factors which we have to take into account if we need to identify which of the groups constitutes minority and which of the groups do not constitute minority. Now, on the basis of this, you know, I can conceptualize them in terms of two different theoretical parameters. When you talk of minority, I think I would like to categorize them as objective criteria and the second is subjective criteria. When you talk of objective criteria, we have in mind those four important factors <laughs> that I just mentioned. Ethnicity, cultural distinctiveness, religious distinctiveness, and linguistic identity. But at the same time, these factors by themselves do not constitute a minority. There I would like to add the subjective criteria. These factors will become meaningful only when the group, it, it can be ethnic group, it can be religious group, it can be linguistic groups, they feel that we need to be organized as a separate group. The, the idea which I said, you know, is that you have to think in terms of self-identifying desire. If you self-identify yourself as separate, as distinct, as an identifiable group, group, only then you can think in terms of being a minority. So I think objective criteria needs to be supported, needs to be complemented by what I call self-identification desire. And this is something which is identified by a you know, lot of UN uh, organization, UN declaration on the rights of persons belonging to national, ethnic, uh, religious, linguistic minorities, and Article 27 of the International Covenant on Civil and Personal Rights. Now, to me, Article 27 is very is directional. It gave me enough inputs to identify which of the groups can be defined as a minority. And I'd like to quote this article. This article talks about specific groups of people located in a particular territorial boundary. And they say, in those territorial boundaries in which ethnic, religious, or linguistic minorities exist, persons belonging to such minorities shall not be denied the right in community with other members of their group to enjoy their own culture and practice their own religion or to use their own language. So Article 27 of this International Covenant identifies the right to practice their own religion, the right to practice their own <coughs> cultural practices, the right to resort to their own language. So the point which I made at the outset, ethnicity, cultural, linguistic, and religious identity, they constitute an important markers of a minority. And Article 27 endorses that. Now, then I looked at you know, some of the you know, other, you know, what is called uh, documents, and there I find Human Rights Committee, they endorse the, the, the subjective <laughs> awareness as being most critical in conceptualizing an identity. So, you know, if you are ethnically separate or independent, it doesn't matter. You have to assert your ethnic identity, ethnic separateness, to exert your identity independent of others. So, Human Rights Committee, in 1994, that report which it came clearly suggests that if you want to be constituted as a minority, you have to assert your authority, assert your rights as a minority. So the point which I made at the outset, the subjective awareness is very important. You have to constitute yourself as a minority since you are different from the rest in terms of your culture, in terms of religion, in terms of your religion, and whatnot. So, 
from with this kind of ICT, you know, there is a there is a problem. So in India, there are a lot of you know what is called tribe Aboriginal groups. Aboriginal groups who also are identified as separate or distinct groups. Now there are also you know the uh, the the international organizations, including the ILO, they also identified them as minorities. But though they are identified already by their cultural identity, they are already identified by their you know, linguistic uh, distinctiveness. But I will say that when you talk of minority, these people who are already identified as separate groups need to be taken into account. So to me, I have problematized the notion of minority further by including the aboriginal groups, whether in Australia, whether in New Zealand, or in India, the tribal groups, to be part of the minority culture. Now, to me, this is a very interesting dimension, since in India, the tribals also need to be taken into account why we conceptualize the minority. It's not merely Kashmiris, it's not merely you know, people from other parts of the country, but the tribals themselves also have a minority status. Now, the second part, religion. What is a religion? What is religion? Now, that's also a very difficult question to address. So to understand religion, I'd like to take you to history. History of Santal Revolution, or Santal Rebel, which is called Bull in the local language, of 1855. Now, Santals were considered to be a minority even to the British. But when they organized themselves against the British, their main source of inspiration was not their linguistic identity was not their cultural identity, but was their religious identity, which was neither in favor of Hinduism nor in favor of Christianity, but in terms of certain pastoral religious denomination, which they identified when they asserted against the British. So they argued that you know, we are different from the British, we are different from the rest of the country, because we have a different religious identity which is articulated in terms of their reverence to, for instance, to a rock, for instance. Reverence to, for instance, to a tree. Reverence to a hill or hill up. So it's a, you know, for them, the religion means a physical representation of certain, what is called, you know, uh, uh, non-animate objects. Reverence to a non-animate object. So, because we are affiliated to those non-animate objects, we are different. So, Hul or Santal Revolution was organized on the basis of their affiliation to the non-animate objects. So, what does religion mean then? Religion means, for them, is nothing but an association with those non-animate objects. So, it is something which is different from the conventional idea of religion. So, then I looked at the historical origin of religion. You know, I found there are certain, you know, what is called, you know, landmark um, conceptualization. And it started with 1200. If you look at the history of religion, the word, the etymology, the epistemology of religion, you'll find we start, we were confronting the word religio, the Latin word religio, in 1200, which simply means worship. Which simply means worship. And then we find that till 1500, religio, the term was utilized to mean worship in general. And only in 1500, I find the church comes in. And the church is trying to define religion as something which is a kind of cementing factor to bring people together. So the religion and institution of religion took place only in 1500. And then we, we found in 1700, there is another tendency which is coming in, where church, religion, and Christianity, and globalization in, in terms of expansion of colonialism, that came into account. So now religion is identified with a group of people supporting one kind of worship and pursuing one kind of political objective. So religion, politics, and the form of worship came together. So to me, as Lincoln Domini said in the morning, religion is an instrumental instrumentality to attain certain goals. It's a goal-driven exercise, which we found 
started in the 1700 onwards. And then, you know, I looked at, you know, different like, languages. Even, for instance, in, in Hindu, the, in the, the term religion, you will hardly find even in the, in the Vedas, even in the Upanishads. And I found that the term religion was used as a form of religious denomination only in the 19th century. You know, Buddhism, Jainism, you know, Taoism. Yeah, that religion became uh, an ideological force started only in the 19th century. Even in the Quran, the idea of din, din is not religion, din is law. So I think the point I'm trying to make that the religion doesn't have a very specific connotation, but religion is essentially a directional device whereby human beings organize their behavior in accordance with certain directional devices. So, and then, you know, I, I took a look at the literature, and I found the first interesting discussion of religion happens to be the one by a professor of Harvard, William James. And William James wrote a book, The Varieties of Religion, in 1902. And there he uh, defined religion in terms of affiliation to a particular sect. So the sect was absent. But the sect will became a part and parcel of human identity since the early part of the 20th century. And then that was continued by you know, French so socialist uh, good kind also. Now then, uh, since I, I don't time, uh, I, I'll just you know, come to the constant assembly debates. Now, minority is very difficult to de define. Religion, broadly speaking, is nothing but a marker of identity, which is direction. Now, how did the founding fathers took into account this religious minority? Again, interestingly, the founding fathers in the debate of the Constitution Assembly, you will hardly find a discussion on minority. The founding fathers talked about minorities in terms of religious minority, in terms of the scheduled castes, and in terms of the backward castes. So three categories of people were taken into account by the founding fathers as part of the minority. And here, there's a huge debate going on. Except Article 29 and 30, you will hardly find anything in the Constitution which talks about minority. But the debate is very interesting because there is an opposition when the minorities were given special privileges whether you talk about right to freedom of religion or whether you talk about Article 317. And that report, somehow or the other, was underplayed. The report on the minority rights, which was placed by Balla Bhai Patel before the assembly, when the debate over fundamental rights, Article Part 14 of the Constitution, were, being, were taking place. Now, they were opposing, they, they, they were opposed to rights to the minority on the basis of that this guarantee to minority rights will harm national unity. So in order to protect national unity, they question the specific privileges given to the minority. And that going on. And they, they, they and, and that was in a, in a very non it was an inconclusive kind of discussion. You know, I was surprised because I tried to find out the, the reason for this, but somehow or the other the report on the minorities was not talked about later. It was talked about for two, three days in 1948, 1948 March, April. But after that, they didn't talk about. So you know, the point which I'm trying to make that I don't have any conclusive things to offer to you because on the basis of the survey of the literature, I found out that nobody wanted to define minority and specifically religious minority in precise terms. But broadly speaking, the point which I made at the outset, that on the basis of our subjective and objective understanding of the situation, we can arrive at a workable definition whereby the focus on ethnicity, the focus on religious identity, the focus on linguistic identity can be identified as features of a minority. And probably that will be a kind of workable definition. And on the basis of this talk discussion today, we'll come up with a very precise definition by the end of the day. Thank you very much. I welcome Mr. M. Seeker, who is among us here, and Mr. Surinder Singh, former Justice of Delhi High Court, and Mr. Surinder Singh, 